everybody now let's welcome on stage our speaker the associate director of pci security standards council mr nitin bhatnagar can you a round of applause for mr nitin please Uh, very good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Wow, that's great. So, so let me. Uh, I think I had a very uh, brief introduction from uh, from you, Vyoma. So, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me start the session without uh, the delay, and uh, uh, this uh, is going to be a little more uh, uh, focused on the the recent uh, updates that the PCI Security Council has got brought in. Uh, with respect to the PSE IDSS version 4.0, and also would like to share the some new changes that have come in uh, to the uh, to the council in terms of uh, your involvement with us. So let me start. Who we are, you know, the PCI Security Standards Council, uh, you know, is a is a global forum, and I think that uh, brings all the payment industry stakeholders together. And uh, the participating payment brands that we have uh, is the Visa, Mastercard, Amex, JCB, Discover, and recently added Union Pay. So moving on to the next uh, slide, uh, you know what we do. I think this is something very important that you know I just wanted to convey to the audience is PCA SSC develops and maintains the PCA data security standards and uh, manages the programs. We do provide trainings, we do provide educational resources, we provide standard implementation and compliance support. What we do not do is enforce or manage these compliances. So uh, when it comes to managing the compliances, it's the responsibility of the each payment uh, brand or the participating payment brand, um, you know, because they are the one who have their own compliance programs. Uh, of its affiliate payment card account data. So any questions that you may have pertaining to the compliance, uh, please uh, uh, you know, uh, have the payment brands privileged to answer them. So but I will try, but uh, not all. Talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the PCSSC strategic framework, uh, you know, uh, and before I uh, look into more deeply into what has been going around, let me also introduce you the mission uh, you know, that we have at PCI Security Standards Council. And our mission is very clear that you can see on the screen also is that to enhance the global payment account data security by developing standards and supporting services that drive education, awareness, and effective implementation of these standards by the stakeholders. And the first foremost pillar, the four pillars that we have, the first pillar is increase industry participation and knowledge, uh, evolve uh, security standards and validation, uh, securing the emerging payment channels, uh, and increase the standard uh, alignment and consistency. So the the entire crux of the next few slides that I'm going to put across is going to revolve around these four pillars uh, that we have at PCI Security Standards Council. Uh, here I would like to uh, first of all thank you for the uh, to NPCI for being their support throughout. Um, you know, in terms of their involvement with as a board of advisors at the council and also being an affiliate member. They're the, they're the one of the affiliate members, uh, you know, from Asia Pacific region. And uh, we today have nine affiliate members globally. So thank you NPCI for that and thanks for giving this opportunity to present, uh, you know, across to the audience. Talking about uh, the spikes in digital payments, and I think we all know, uh, and there was a recent report from the ACI Worldwide uh, that indicates that around 70.3 billion real-time payment transactions were processed uh, globally in 2020, and uh, uh, you know which has seen a surge of close to 41 percent compared to the previous years. Uh, you know which could be a pre-COVID uh, scenario, and I think I'm sure these numbers would have uh, these numbers are already growing and would grow. Uh, and I think uh, as you see, the three and the four transactions will be digital uh, in 2025. Uh, talking about the uh, the global threat landscape, uh, I think uh, you know when we talk about uh, you know expanding businesses, and I think that means more target and and data for the criminals, right? And uh, as you can see on the screen, you know close to 86.2 percent of uh, organizations were compromised by at least one successful attack. Uh, you know, and uh, talking about uh, the second stat, 69 percent of the more than two third of organizations were victimized by ransomware. I think this has been keeping everyone busy, you know, when we talk about ransomware. 
and uh, 91 percent, 9 out of 10 organizations have been affected by cyber attacks uh, targeting the web and the mobile applications. Now, uh, the one stats which is not there on the screen is all about uh, uh, majority uh, of uh, the organizations are also lacking behind creating education and awareness and getting trained uh, their resources on how to protect their infrastructure and how to protect their uh, data from the external threats. So training is one of the areas that uh, probably we all may need to look at and enhancing the, uh, the, uh, these, the skills and also, you know, the, uh, the aspects pertaining how you can secure your payment infrastructure, uh, how you can uh, help in, uh, in, uh, in protecting the payment data, uh, just not domestically, globally. Emphasizing on some top five learnings, um, and I think uh, those learnings are very clear. Uh, you know, the, the first learning is around securing the, the vulnerable loopholes, which uh, probably, um, you know, uh, highlights on the, you know, the vulnerabilities which have the CV uh, SS score of 6.5 and higher should be mitigated immediately. And, you know, you should also run a, a data discovery and a classification tool across your organization. The second is strengthening the endpoint responses, you know, ensuring that all the endpoints are monitored and uh, use cases are, uh, of the, you know, the endpoints are configured properly. Uh, deploying intelli intelligent monitoring is the third learning uh, that we can all talk about, you know, ensuring the monitoring activities, uh, you know, covers the entire technology infrastructure, just not specifics, and, um, and you know, deploy some machine learning based, uh, um, you know, anomaly detection tools. Fourth uh, is on setting up the diligent access management, uh, probably, you know, performing periodic reviews uh, on your uh, applications, uh, you know, uh, do the audits properly. I, I think that's more important. Having access management is critical. Uh, executing a proper incident response plan is more um, uh, important, you know, in terms of understanding if something goes wrong, what are the next steps that you need to take. Uh, and having this, um, this uh, incident response and forensics uh, built within the organization, uh, you know, teams would help in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, you know, securing the your payment infrastructure. Talking about the PCI Security Standards Council, I think uh, the, the screen that you see, uh, uh, we have 15 data security standards uh, today and uh, all uh, the actors that you see on the screen, starting from issuer to merchant, the vendor solution, uh, vendors or the solution providers, acquire processor issuers, they have to uh, adopt to these standards. Uh, not uh, necessarily all the standards are required to be adopted by the uh, by the payment actors in the ecosystem, but definitely each actor has a role to play. For example, an issuer would have to look for pin security as one of the standard card protection, physical card protection, logical. Talking about the token service provider, the DSPs, uh, you know, the, when you come to the uh, to the merchants and the solution uh, solution providers and the vendor, there's a there's a bouquet of standards that you have to look at which is starting from PIN, transaction security, payment application data security center, which definitely is going to, uh, is retired now, uh, and probably we have also stopped accepting new application on PADSS. It's getting migrated to PCI SSM, which is software security framework, point-to-point uh, -point encryption, PCI 3DS, PCI CPOC, SPOC, uh, and the list goes on. Now, uh, when I talk about these standards, again, the compliance to these standards are being enforced by the payment brands, uh, payment participating payment brands. So in case you have any concerns and queries uh, pertaining to the compliance program to the standards, you may have to reach out to your respective uh, payment brands or payment network. Um, moving on to the next slide, and uh, here I'm going to talk more about uh, the PCISS version 4.0 and the the updates on the mobile payment on COT standard. So here, you know, before I uh, get into the changes, just wanted to highlight, which is self-explanatory, we have gone through three uh, major RFCs, uh, requests for comment from the global industry. Uh, the first RFC has seen uh, current comments on around 3,000 comments from 153 companies. We had RFC 2, which has seen 1,800 comments from 124 companies. We have 1,300 comments from 87 companies in RFC 3. Now, overall, we have received close to 6,000 plus feedback from 200 plus unique companies. So, this is the, the upgradation to the standard version 
4.0 has been possible because of this massive feedback that we have received globally from the global companies across and uh, that helped us uh, evolve and make this uh, make the PCIDSS version 4.0 more robust. The four goals that we have taken uh, uh, as one of the consideration is ensuring the standard uh, continues to meet the security uh, uh, need uh, of the payment industry, adding flexibility is one of the key goals that we have taken into consideration and promoting security as a continuous process as well as the another goal that we have taken as one of the benchmark and uh, enhancing validation methods and procedures where, uh, where which I'm going to talk about. So now the validation methods have got uh, evolved. Initially, it was just a defined approach what we give you as a standard, but now we also have come up with the customized approach which I'm going to talk in my next few slides. So the evolution has happened to the PCIDSS version 4 auto and which requires the industry to get educated, understand, aware on how uh, the implementation to the version PCIDSS version 4.0 would help uh, them in protecting the payment data. So as you see on my screen, the 12 requirements, uh, you know, these 12 requirements ideally remain the same. But, uh, you know, also what we have done, we have evolved, uh, you know, the requirements. Requirement number one, which talks about, uh, uh, you know, install and maintain network security control. So, so we updated here the, the firewall technology. Uh, terminology, uh, sorry, uh, for that, uh, this firewall terminology has been evolved here and we are now talking about network security controls. The requirement number two, when we talked about defaults, now we have evolved that to apply secure configuration to all system components. So just not the default passwords or the, or the user names that you need to take care of. Uh, protect account data. So uh, we are talking about protect stored account data. So the evolution on the uh, on the, when we are talking about the card data, it has evolved to the account data now. It's just not the card data. Uh, protecting uh, the cardholder data with a strong cryptography during transmission over uh, open public networks. Uh, requirement number five now has also evolved from protect all systems and networks from malicious softwares. Requirement number six, specifically, we have included software. As we, have, uh, as we are moving from PADSS to PCA uh, SSF, which is uh, your software security framework. So the standard requirements are also evolving when it comes to PCADSS standard. And the software is the one of the key areas that is going to be considered uh, in uh, protecting the payment data. Uh, so requirement number seven, uh, restrict access to the system components and cardholder data by business need to know. Uh, nine and eight and nine remains the same. Identify users, authenticate users to system components. Restrict physical access to cardholder data. Uh, requirement number ten uh, talks about log and monitor the all access and system components and cardholder data. Uh, requirement number eleven test the security of systems and network regularly. And last requirement, which has got little um, evolved drastically, is supporting the information security with the organization policy and program. So, so this is what the 12 requirements looks like. They are still there, but they have evolved drastically. And there are some major changes to these requirements when we go in depth. Uh, talking about um, Validating to PCIDSS, I think it's one one thing that you know the industry has always been been looking for. How should we? Because there are always a challenge when the organizations see you know in terms of implementing the PCIDSS requirements. So uh, talking about the defined approach, I think the defined approach is very straightforward. Where you have the standard, we have the uh, the uh, approach defined, uh, you know, and you follow those approaches and then implement the PCI requirements. Where the QSA comes in. Uh, SSR environment, and you follow the standard requirements of the of the of what what's been mentioned in the standard, and then you are done with that. So what we have done is uh, we have evolved uh, validating the PCIDS version 4.0, and we have added flexibility with different methodologies, the kind of techno emerging technologies that we are seeing. So we have also come up with the customized approach, and the uh, the entities uh, uh, you know can now. Uh, define and implement the uh, the controls uh, based on their uh, risk appetite and uh, the kind of uh, uh, the new emerging payment channels they may be seeing or probably the new emerging technologies they may be using they can now use the customized approach as one of the option to validate your uh, PCIDSS uh, uh, standard version 4.0 so uh, here the the entities uh, 
you know, who can do this? I think the customized approach is always a question to us that, you know, will every organization across the globe will be able to accept or, uh, you know, adopt to the customized approach? The answer is is yes and no. Uh, the uh, When I say yes or no, is uh, the customized approach is only for those organizations who have a robust risk management processes or uh, they have a strong risk management team within their organization and they have been doing PCI for a long and they have, uh, uh, they have been adding new technologies or new, uh, you know, payment forms within their infrastructure or their, uh, on their uh, ecosystem. So that's where the customized approach will come into the play and uh, and organizations can look at evaluating this as one of the approach to validate to the PCIDSS version 4.0. So uh, I think many of you would be familiar here about uh, the compensating controls and the customized approach. So, so let's not get confused between the customized uh, approach and the compensating control. So compensating com control uh, intent remains the same when we talk about when you have, uh, when you're stuck with uh, implementing any of the PCI requirements because of any business or a technical constraint, that's where the compositing controls comes into the picture. While the customized approach is something, you know, uh, uh, where you have to uh, use uh, the, uh, the defined objective. There is not going to be defined objectives within the standard, but you have to divide, derive something of yours, test it by yourself, uh, make sure you document yourself, uh, and it's something that you need to, uh, to evaluate within your organization, and the QSS role is very limited here. So QSA is just going to come and review those uh, customized approaches within the organization, not create something for you so so the customized approach cannot be uh, cannot be mis uh, uh, understood with the compensating controls compensating controls have a different intent altogether they are still there with the standard uh, but the customized approach is where you have to uh, you have to use uh, the uh, the standard uh, in terms of meeting your new a set of requirements that have generated because you are using some new technologies or you are uh, you are deploying something on or a cloud infrastructure or you are probably trying to uh, build a new uh, application altogether to uh, to protect the payment data now the compensating controls are not an option with the customized approach uh, the entity is expected to implement an effective customized control without needing to also implement an alternate compensating control so so that's the difference between a compensating control and a customized approach so the customized approach, uh, you know, I, I, let me go a little more in deep on the role, which I just uh, highlighted. So every customized approach that you are going to adopt has to be, uh, has to be developed by the organization. Uh, you have to test all those requirements, whether you are meeting those or not. You have to do a targeted risk analysis within that particular approach that you are going to use to implement that particular requirement. The QSA role is here to come and validate whether you are going in the right direction or not. The QSA role, in, our, in terms of their independence of the QSA re requirements that they have, they are going to come and only evaluate your customized approach, not define or develop something specifically for your organization. So that's something that you need to take care of. And, and the, the roles are very clear. Uh, the, the approach that you take is your responsibility at the end of the day, but the evaluation will happen uh, and reviewed by the QSA to make sure or ascertain that you are going in the right direction. So here working together uh, in all with the QSAs is going to be a very key element. So you need to make sure that you are working uh, very, very closely with your QSS to understand what are the nitty gritties that may come by when you are implementing the PCIDSS version 4 auto. So I'm going to talk more on that, uh, you know, when, when we talk about the timelines and the implementation, uh, you know, the, uh, the implementation timelines that an organization, a large organization should be looking at uh, when it comes to implementing the PCIDSS. So this slide is largely, you know, which entities can use the customized approach. So so entities that complete a self-assessment questionnaire are not eligible to use a customized approach. So if you are using an SEQ as one of the options to meet the PCI requirements uh, to, um, to, uh, to you know, obey the compliance requirements of, of the regulator or any, any, uh, any entity that you are reporting into. So the SEQs is not, uh, is not, they are not eligible for the customized approach. 
So PCI, uh, you know, what you see on the screen is PCI has 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 come up with a lot of guidance when it comes to uh, to you know understanding on the on the standard itself. You know what else? So we have come up with the guidance. So initially in the 3.2.1 standard, there was limited uh, support in terms of how you should be implementing the PCI DSS uh, requirements to meet the uh, certain objectives. Now here we have come up with the guidance specifically how you should be approaching to certain requirements to implement them. And uh, and you know, uh, there are some supporting implementation support guidance document also uploaded on the PCI document library which is going to be helpful and useful for you to uh, to implement uh, the PCI DSS version 4.0. So uh, the next slide largely talks on the support that we are giving. Uh, so we have included cloud and other technologies as uh, uh, as one of the key areas within the PCI DSS version 4.0. So though uh, PCI DSS has always been a technology neutral standard, you may not see all the technologies being mentioned in the standard, but yes, definitely, uh, when it comes to securing the payment data, uh, the standards can be adopted uh, to secure any any data or information which uh, which is. Uh, is uh, critical for an organization. So, so the standard has gone uh, beyond the uh, the traditional uh, way of looking at it. So, the DSS version 4.0 helps you in in meeting whatever those objectives that you have to secure the payment data within your organization. Talking about uh, implementing the PCI DSS version 4.0, so the timelines are very straightforward. Uh, we are in the last quarter of 2022, so the official documents are all released. Uh, the training is announced, so the training is happening as we talk uh, on the on the transitional training. So we have not. Uh, announced any new QSA trainings at this point. The, this is a transition training from version 3.2.1 to version 4.0. So the existing QSAs have been getting trained. Existing ISAs are getting trained uh, to get um, a quick hands-on on the implementation of PCI DSS version 4.0. Coming on to the quarter 2023, uh, the training goes on and uh, the quarter 1, uh, which is 31st March 2024, the PCI DSS version 3.2.1 retires. Now, uh, now there are implementation for the future data requirements. There are future data requirements that are uh, being taken into consideration. So you have time until 31st March 2025, uh, you know, for the future date requirements uh, that will become effective. Still, then, when I talk about the future data requirements or the new requirements, you can still use the old uh, uh, requirements to meet the when you are going for version 3.2.1 or 4.0. But they become effective from 31st March 2025. Until then, you, it's in a transition. You can start implementing. You can start uh, executing the implementation for these new future data requirements so that, uh, so that when they become effective, you do not face any challenge. So what is your implementation timeline? Uh, let, me, uh, let me put it this way. How many organizations here, you know, how many people sitting here uh, are going through the PCI compliance? I, I see few hands. So, ideally, you know, I'm assuming that you are a large corporates or large organizations, right? So, so we have a two years of transition timeline, which we are already six months we have crossed. So, I'm I'm going to talk about um, you know the the very old age principle that we all have heard about is the Plan Do Check Act. So the so this is where we are. What we are we are sitting today is is planning stage right so planning is where you understand what the standard brought in you know what the standard is talking about reading through the standard understanding the standard uh, you know requirements what is the new challenge that it can bring to your organization while implementing PCIDS version 4.0 then you have do you know where you are going to uh, create some um, working groups within your organization to understand these challenges and how this is going to impact you in the long run so the, so plan Get your team equipped to understand what the standard is all about. Do you know? Create working groups. Create uh, you know some sessions. Get external uh, you know assessors you know, bring into your organization to understand how this is going to um, compass you know in, ter in terms of the implementation. Check with your QSA how the implementation is going to happen. What further improvements or the addition of the tools and technologies that you need to take into consideration, and then act accordingly in. 2024 to get your PCDSS version 4.0 implemented. So you have to go in a very planned manner. Uh, two years, if you think it's uh, it's it's a very it's a two years, you know. Probably we think 
those all you know it's it's a long it's not long at all it's it's just a matter of time you know when we release the standard on 31st march this year we are already in september so you can assume six months have already passed by and uh, it's very important and that's where i would like to emphasize on if you are executing uh, and if you're planning to adhere to the timelines when the PCHS version 3.2.1 retires and you are transitioning from 3.2.1 to version 4.0 in a seamless manner you may have to adopt to an approach which is plan do check and act and uh, make sure that you know you are uh, not com non compliant to any of the regulatory requirements so talking about what we have been working on recently uh, we have been uh, been working on the new standard on the mobile payments so the mobile payments on courts uh, is going to be released uh, uh, as we talk you know in uh, December this year so we already have PCI CPOC PCI SPOC uh, for the for the contactless payments and for the uh, for the uh, uh, you know the pin acceptance so this is standard is largely uh, is going to uh, focus on uh, it's going to be amalgamation of both the PCI CPOC and SPOC and you will see a PCI MPOC as one of the standard which is going to help in securing your mobile payments and um, and this is standard is still working and thanks to all the industry stakeholders from India who have been giving their inputs and feedback and thanks to NPCI again uh, being part of it uh, and we will see this new standard coming in uh, in December 2022 As I move towards uh, my submission of the slides and getting involved is critical in order to influence these standards and um, when I talk about influencing the standards and I think in India has been uh, been on a growing path when I took up this role in 2018 with PCI uh, we just had one one participating organization who was involved with the council today we have around 25 participating organizations who are involved with the council including uh, the NPCI as one of our affiliate member and who sits on the board of advisors as well so uh, that's important in order to influence the standards there is an industry participation which is required because we uh, without the support from the industry without the feedback that we get from the industry it's very difficult for us to evolve and make these standards more robust so uh, in that league, I think we have the community meetings and the industry programs that keeps coming up. So, so we just last week uh, some of the North American community meeting. We are coming up with the Europe community meeting in Italy in October, and then in November there's going to be an Asia Pacific forum, which is going to happen. Uh, dates are yet to be announced for that. So, so what we have introduced this year is a new participation organization program. So now there are going to be, initially it has used to be, be only two levels. Uh, so basically, not a two levels, it's only one, uh, which is participating organization, which was, which was restricted. But now we have announced a new participation, uh, participating organization program, which we have three levels, which is to principal, associate and individual. So initially the individuals were not uh, having access to the PCI SSC resources. Now we have opened uh, to the associates, to the individuals, and to the principal. So where you can, you know, the the principals uh, can, um, you know, uh, add more inputs, more collaboration, and more interaction on a both technical and strategic levels. Uh, talking about the associates, uh, it generates more uh, opportunities to interact, more influence to the standards, and more occasion to get involved. Then when we talk about the individual member benefits, I think it's it's all about, uh, you know, more community expertise at the table, uh, more access to the resources, more collaboration opportunities. Which means that it gives uh, more seats at the table. So currently we have only 30 seats across the board of advisors. Now this number of seats will get increased to 56, which is is massive in number so and that's where the kind of involvement that we are looking from the global payment industry to support us in influencing the payment standards now uh, the BOA will now get uh, get uh, option to vote to the new standards for publication and major revision to the standards initially uh, it's the the it's the uh, is the uh, PCI security standard council who uh, who, uh, who are deciding on what the standards that we need to develop with the support for the payment uh, participating payment brands but now this is going to get changed now the new standards publications would decide on what the board of advisors uh, inputs says so so it's all now been back to the industry if India as a country wants a new specific uh, standard to be worked out 
for the global perspective, definitely the answer is yes. And I think that's where the more involvement and, and the opportunities will open the door for the Indian payment industry to help us in developing these standards to secure the payment ecosystem. Um, at the PCI Security Standard Council, we have uh, you know a couple of trainings which can help you in uh, in uh, enhancing your skills in terms of uh, you know securing the payment data. So we have a PCP, PCIP, which is a Payment Card Industry Professional Certificate, and uh, which is an individual qualification for implementing and maintaining the PCI DSS to secure your cardholder data. So this uh, certificate remains with you. It's a it, it remains with you for three years, and uh, it helps you in in overall uh, archiving your growth uh, within uh, the organization as well as helping organization secure the payment data. The, the second that we have is ISA in addition to the QSA. So ISA helps you in, uh, in uh, so ISA are almost equal to the QSA, uh, but if you, have, if, you are, if you are ISS within the organization, then it helps you in running your own show, means you can, you can audit your environment, you can understand the, the challenges that you may have, what probably the QSA may come in and you know probably will tell you and you get, you you certainly you have some you you don't get time because when you bring in the QSAs and they come up with their implementation challenges uh, you know you take some time to implement them but this is something can be avoided when you have the ISS within so ISS can do the similar audits like the QSA does and uh, because they have been trained equally, the QSs and ISs are trained by the same trainers, same platform, same content. Uh, and, uh, and also the good part is that ISs can sign off on the reports. With that, um, you know, probably I would request everyone to participate. Uh, you know, if you, are ha if you are looking at joining council in some way, please do send us an email at participation at pcisecuritystandards.org and we would be glad to help you. Thank you very much. Any questions, anybody? You do ask any question if you have. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, Nitin. Yeah, hi. Hi, this is Sarat. Uh, hi. So, uh, very good presentation. Uh, so, one thing that I'm uh, thinking about is, you know, when, when you see a uh, cardholder data breach, you know, from you know, different organizations, as a council, are you actually going back and seeing what was the, you know, gap, why this was happening, even though, you know, they are, you know, PCI compliant and all that? <laughs> Yeah, see, it, it answer this question, I think, as I said, you know, this is more towards the compliance. Uh, because the, it's the, the participating payment brands or the payment networks, they're the one who run the compliance programs. As I said, you know, we develop the standards, right. we manage these standards, that's the role. Yeah. But uh, we have a program called Payment Forensic Investigator, which is PFI, right? Payment Forensic Investigator role is to get involved in these payment data breaches that happen and submit the reports to the payment networks. But what we get is an appendix which talks about certain requirements which were not met. Now based on that inputs that we receive, we, uh, we take those feedbacks into consideration and make, uh, we try to see you know, how we can evolve these standards and we float the RFCs to the industry where the industry people come in and they contribute to the feedback. Now initially it was a lot of restricted but as I said you know this, now this is open to the, to the public which is now uh, an individual even can join PCI Security Standard Council today and provide those inputs and feedback in addition to the associate and the, uh, the principal members that we will have. Now uh, having said that, these, uh, the, if I have to talk about the basics you know and the top three learnings have been why these data breaches happens are the three reasons. One if you have a, have a very, um, uh, you don't have a strong password you know, the second uh, is uh, is your insecure remote access, and uh, you know, the third is uh, largely you know when you are uh, not updating your systems with the latest patches. And these are the three basics. You know, there's no rocket science to why a data breach happens, but but these are the three basic things. You know, if an organization is able to take care of then you know, we can avoid those breaches. And I think one important thing that we have taken into consideration in the standard uh, PCISC version 4.0 is involving the multi-factor authentication requirement. So this has evolved drastically from what you have been seeing in the version 3.2.1. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Nitin, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. So, Nitin, just one more question. As certain has come up with a guidelines that any data breach has to be reported within six hours. So, is PCI also planning to uh, uh, bring up on some timelines that if there is a breach, then they can inform the council and then, uh, you know... It, it doesn't get to report report. to the council, uh, uh, but uh, typically, uh, if there is a payment data breach, at least specifically to a payment, you know, data, uh, you know, probably you have to report to the payment networks. Right. And uh, that is immediately that you identify there's a breach and then the PFI investigation process starts. So they, I think I'm, uh, every, uh, there's a different requirements altogether but yes, you have to adhere to what the local uh, government rules is. At the same time what your, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is your uh, obligations towards your partners in the industry. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned about ISA just now, yeah. right? So is it like building our internal talent uh, to do the ISA or is it similar like uh, what we are doing for the QSA? So ISA is uh, is something an internal security assessor program. So QSA is an qualified. So QSA, ISA is a is has to be sponsored by an individual organization. For example, an X organization wants to get ISAs within, so that organization is going to sponsor you. So so IS, QSA can do work for many. ISA has to be only restricted to the particular organization, right? So ISA, uh, you know, is a training which is a, a which is a, a program which is to help uh, the organizations build their internal expertise and help uh, you know internally to secure the payment data. Understand well in advance what are the challenges that are going to come across when the QSA comes in. So prior to that, you are ready when the QSA comes in. So it is a hassle-free journey for you towards the compliance to the standards. Okay, so basically, yeah, basically, but the ISA feature is also that you can sign off on the reports also. That also gives you flexibility. Yeah. Okay.